gonna give it a few. Right now I got zero watching, that's okay. Just give it a little few. Oh, this is an important video that I'm about to do mostly because, <clears throat> hold on, I'm getting reverb. There, got none. All right. <clears throat> hey, whoever the one is, <laughs> gonna wait just a little more, give it about uh, another minute and I'm just going to start recording or doing the live feed. Sorry for the delay. So uh, what we're going to talk about today, first off, let me, two things. Someone, I've had a couple calls about or comments about Moors. The whole Moor construct is a fake CIA ops that was started in the 1950s. Um, and I actually got down to the nitty-gritty of this whole more debauchery um, when I talked to someone who was an American black man who had bought into this whole more thing and there's a couple things about the fake moors first off the term L and Bay is a title of nobility so if you're running around calling yourself L and Bay you just removed yourself from the Republic rights and um, nullified any claim you have pursuant to emoluments clause and titles of nobility. So it's not very smart if you're an American black person to cast aside the title American, which is the highest title in law in the world, um, for a title of nobility name, L or Bay. And so when you do that, you basically remove yourself from the American right. So that's just dumb because you lose the ability to make the claims that you're trying to make <laughs> in law. You lose all power and sense of ability to, to hold a position of trust or power, including an American sovereign with a claim of allodial rights to land. So even if you had them, which you don't. The whole construct of the Moore Nation claim is that <laughs> these people believe that the United States was the country Morocco <laughs> before it was anything even related to the native tribal lands uh, you know, the, the Navajo Nation. So they're actually trying to supplant even the native tribal claims that the American natives have to this land that were well established and founded by the law and have since been cooed by the foreign fake Masons, uh, not of the American right. And I'll go about over that in a minute. So I talked to my friend who had decided to call himself a Moor instead of an American, and I explained to him that that's an error for a variety of reasons, but found out his foundations of his Moor beliefs, and that is that um, it pertains to the Barbary Coast Wars, um, where there was a treaty <laughs> effected during them um, between the Moors, who had kidnapped um, American uh, naval men, um, and we're holding 200 of them captive. So the treaty is basically a, an agreement where they agree to pay a ransom. So I don't, you know, and, and after paying the ransom, they agree to operate in comedy, amity, and peace. Okay, so the Moors, who are landless, they are, they are a landless tribe. Uh, they were displaced in Spain and kicked out of Spain for their horrendous crimes against Christians and they wouldn't stop killing Christians. So the Spanish kicked them out and their landless tribe in reality, the Moors are. Um, the Moor nation does not exist, it has no land, if it ever did exist, which it didn't. It's a subclass of people that are Muslims. It's like uh, with, it's like saying the Sandaheen are a nation, you know, the Sandaheen. So this is a tribe of the people who live within the dominion of the Spanish Dominion, and they were a tribe of Muslims who were killing Christians all over the place. And they were kicked out, and they were driven into the mountains by the Spanish themselves for their horrendous crimes against Christians. So to claim that you're a Moor is just saying you're a murderous barbarian, first off. So that I don't even know why you would do that as a born American. So there was a ransom paid by the United States for these army, and then this is the treaty 
that they're talking about um, under the Barbary Coast. The word Barbary Coast is where you get barbarism. So the Moors were considered barbaric. That's where the term barbarism comes from, is the Barbary Coast uh, scenario where Moors kidnapped and murdered American naval men and held them for ransom and solicited a treaty of peace and amity. Well, there's another statement. This doesn't come up again, the Moors, until something in 1950 where there's a declaration by in the United States Senate to the Moor people and all the great things they've done for the United States and how they're great United States citizens. This is the foundation that started the whole, we are Moors, we have land rights, blacks were here, it's the Moroccan nation before native tribes were here. None of these claims are founded in fact. There are no, there was no Moorish nation. Uh, there are no history of archeological digs finding any natives of the indigenous areas of Spain, which would be even classified as Moors. Uh, that predate the natives. They're trying to say the natives were black people from using these fake pictures of uh, which are photographs. The fact that they're photographs tell you they're fake because nothing, uh, photography was not around at the time to do these things. So everything related to the Moore claims are all fake. And anyone who is following them is either completely miseducated in the law, completely miseducated in the foundations of these claims. Uh, and and or and or just shells promoting CIA operatives. Now, why would they do this? Well, in comes JIDIFA. Uh, JIDIFA is uh, an international organization that was started by Ferdinand Marcos. Okay, you've heard me talk about JIDIFA and Angel Marcos. Well, according to Angel Marcos's um, representatives, who I speak to um, and have contact with. Um, JIDIFA, as it's being um, ran by the United Nations, has been co-opted, is not uh, authorized to operate that the way that it is, even if it's under the United States Charter. And the reason for the whole JIDIFA more thing is this. JIDIFA was founded so that um, people of the native tribal lands, like the people of the country, would have some type of rights internationally pursuant to what the national governments were doing. That's what's supposed to be the purpose. So this is where native claims come. So what they've done, people with the coup of the world have taken the, the JIDIFA organization and are trying to slide the more in, the more rights, which are fictions. This is total CIA ops. But what they're trying to do is overlay Sharia law over the United States based upon these fake more claims in collusion with the fake, with the co-opters in the United Nations of JIDIFA. Okay. So... Uh, they're trying to use this fake more tribe stuff, which is a complete uh, psyops, founded nothing in law, founded nothing in fact. There's absolutely zero foundation to anything Moorish in anything related to law or even history or archaeology. It's a complete fabrication. It's a psyops that they're trying to use with the JIDIFA to, to bring to literally say that the United States is a Moroccan nation, that the, the Moors have elodio rights to the land even before the native tribes, and that they uh, can bring their Sharia law onto the United States. And the United Nations is actually conspiring with these co-opters and these CIA operatives to try to impose that. That's what's going on in the southern border. That was the plan under Obama and Hillary. Had Hillary won, they were going to march uh, the more claim through the United Nations and China and these Indochina things um, across the southern border and just claim the United States as a, as a Sharia law nation. And that's the coup is involved in trying to oppress Sharia law on top of our uh, allodial rights. Uh, which is, I mean, the funny thing is, is the Moors act like they were the founders of Islam or something. I don't even know. The, the people who are running around with these fake more things, they're just ignorant people or shills or tools. I mean, there's no foundation for what they're claiming. And again, calling yourself an L or a Bay uh, is professing, that'd be like me going, I'm King Lotus. Okay, if you do that, you have no rights in American law. You're done. So if you are a, a person of native descent from this country, your best claim is to be an American. That's what people aren't understanding. They've tried to undermine the American right. And I'm going to show you that in this video. Being an American is the highest sovereign claim in the world. 
Um, there is no other title of a nation that has the same rights as an American. We are sovereign by the word. Okay, that's why they war upon us. So to surrender your rights and say I'm not an American to say I'm an African American or I'm a Moor uh, is just ridiculous. And, and on the subjects of slavery and reparations, there's nobody today that owes anybody anything except for governments owing my people and the native tribal claims that do that are founded in law, which n are not the Moors. The Moor claims are complete hoo-ha. There's nothing to them. They're fraud. They're moot. I don't care. I mean, they're easy to, to remove in law. And they're just part of a CIA operative and coup. They're part of the coup deep state. So fake Moors are part of the deep state coup that they've been trying to establish fake claims to the alluvial lands of the United States and have a superior claim to the land to try to claim it for the, for, for the Rothschilds, truly, and, and the Pope. But so going around calling yourself a king or, or giving yourself titles, surrendering your title of American to be called King Lotus or whatever uh, is not smart in law and you actually undermine your rights. So that whole thing and Jidifa are all related. Those more fake more claims and Jidifa, that's all related. That's the United Nations PSYOPs. Those are all deep state actors. Um, I'm not sure <laughs> if the Angel Marcos people versus the other Jidifa people are commingled. I have a feeling that that whole camp is compromised. Um, it's a possibility. Again, according to the Angel Marcos um, agents, Jidifa through the United Nations is not an authorized activity. That the United Nations, if they are operating under Jidifa, are fraudulently operating under Jidifa and do not have the authority of the heirs or the, the originators of that United Nations activity or grant, you know, uh, um, organization. So their call on the United Nations criminals at this regard. And, and, and that's, you know, their claim is Angel Marcos has purportedly 55 Indo-European nations in independent contract where they are representative of the native tribes of 50 of over 55 nations um, that are not being that are represented by by foreign agent cooing people. And so their their desire is to remove all the esquires. So Angel Marcos if he is an heir, I don't know if he is. I actually know heirs to the Filipino empire. I went to school with some of them, <laughs> okay? Uh, they hid them all over the United States because they knew that they would be targeted. Uh, but um, if he is a, a legitimate heir, uh, well, even if he isn't, he has these countries in contract, um, the people of the nation. So he has 55 nations in contract that are arguing that the United Nations is a cooing instrument and that the banking is a cooing instrument and that they've r raped the people of their lodial rights and their lodial claims. So I'm going to sort that out. That's all going to be sorted out in the law in the near future as to whether Angel Marcos is a legitimate claim or not. He's claiming he has the rights to this and they have to, he, if he can prove it in what we'll go over in a moment, which is uh, predatory causes of, you know, predatory claims or actions where he's going to challenge the legitimacy of the occupation of these countries or these 55 nations are arguing the occupation by Rothschild banking squires who are oppressing the people. He had, he, that's what the claim is. So these more people, you are way down the totem pole because there is my claim as an allodial heir to the United uh, States of America. My family helped found this country. Multiple uh, uh, ones of my, of my forefathers and, and foremothers helped found this country and are direct ties to royalty of Europe that have a Lodio right claim. So I have a blood right claim that I can prove through uh, my lineage, my blood right lineage, my genealogy, my pedigree is provable. And I have a claim that I've put everyone in, every, that I have brought forth a claim against the coup uh, concerning the, the kidnapping of my son, the illegal salvaging and, and kidnapping of my son as a American vessel under Admiralty International fake law right now. Uh, because it's, we're going to discuss that the fact that the treaty that they're founding all these things on are fraudulent. I have made a claim for anyone who is of a blood right heir to the allodial United Estates of America that are the originating treaty and banking platform. 
that the whole world has now seized and has is operating offsets and adjustments on through the Federal Reserve Act and coup. So the more claims are way down the totem pole, you know, when you go and you're going to sue someone in bankruptcy, the ones with the most rights to things are the ones on top. And so it will be going the American right, and then it will be going the native tribal rights, including the Native Americans, and uh, of this continent, um, those rights, because those are established proper as rights under the de jure law, and those laws were cooed so that they could steal the land, really, from the people, though the American right affirms that they have that right. So the de jure law affirms the rights of the native tribal lands to the na- and the trusts. Um, they were supposed to be paid tenancy agreements on some things and stuff like that. So those are the second. Then you're going to have, you know, then if we're suing the instrument post-reconstruction, which has brought the Rothschild banking to these 55 nations under the Fed Act, then those 55 nations are next. So I don't, the Moors have no nation. There is no nation of Moors. Morocco does not claim these American Moors. They have nothing to do with it. They would never claim them. They kick them out. So anyone calling them a Moor that was not born in Morocco is just a fraud, okay? You're just an ignorant person who is a victim of psyops. And you need to educate yourself. So let's set aside the more thing now. But I wanted you to understand how it's all entangled. Okay, so real quick before I forget. Going to Masons. Um, you all, I talk about Masons being... Um, uh, they're 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 cooed okay they're cooed and i talk about bad masons and good masons okay so the masons that started this country started the american right which was abandoned in coup okay it w- after the treaty of 1812 which created the sesque and allowed the masons and the esquires and doctors where they commingled in their masonic temples okay so the masons are an ecclesiastic right folks the esquires and doctors are a monarchical right. They're a monarchical title. So the Masons and their ecclesiastic rights and grants, which were, uh, which kind of extended the Templar rights into the new order of Masonry, who brought us the all the rights that the papacy ex, uh, granted under the Scottish right, the ancient accepted Scottish right that freed Scotland, and the York right were brought together under our Constitution. So our Constitution is founded on the ancient accepted Scottish right and the York right. Okay, and I tell you they're cooed. Um, excuse me. <laughs> the ancient accepted Scottish right. <clears throat> um, just a moment. I want to clear my voice before we get too much further in here. Give me a second. Okay, there we go. So the ancient accepted Scottish right is founded on tanistry, where women are fem sol, which means women are equal to men in law. And their rights to their estates are not diminutized when they get married or have children. So marriage is not a subjugating activity in the ancient accepted Scottish rite. And post-reconstruction, this was affirmed in like the second or third statute in post-reconstruction, they defined, they by statute, declared every woman in the United States fem sol, which means equal to men. So how we get from late 1800s fem sol Scottish rite to now where they had to have you know the 14th amendment and stuff where all people were conveyed this privileges and immunities to vote and equity when in the constitution they clearly are already equitable so what you have is is you have the constitutional law which affirms rights and then you have the esquires overlaying it trying to re re atorn what rights are trying to say no we're going to give you these rights with certain alien uh, you know un- which are supposed to be unalienable but we're going to lean them certain ways and manipulate them so that we take away the substantial rights a little bit at a time that's what their purpose is so the woman is equity is equitable to the man in the ancient accepted scottish right she is actually the blood right holder of the estate as the female that births the child that will be the allodial heir to the king's kingdom so uh, the tanist is the representative of the king that's your republic government so the reason why and the manner in which our government was able to be founded is based upon the ancient accepted scottish right and the york right now I just told you the Scottish right puts women in equity. Well, I happen to have a friend who is a 33rd degree Mason. 
Okay, and this is his um, his record of of how he was uh, when he was brought into the Masonic Order of I think he was a thirty degree Mason. Yeah, it's the so this is his certificate of becoming a thirtieth degree Mason. And he was this I th I think. He was this before 30s. He's a really good guy. However, he's not their kind of Mason. And he just so showed this to me the other day because I'm kind of re-educating him to the Masonic orders because even what he was told was a lie. You see this right here? You see that right there? You see that there's a Quran citation? This is the imagery on their certificate of Masonic order of the modern era. At least when this was issued in 1980. You see that there's a Quran on there? There's no way, if they are under the ancient and accepted Scottish Rite, there should be any quote from the Quran on a Masonic instrument. Okay, this is an official Masonic copy of this. This has a seal and an embossing. You know, this is his Masonic certificate. I am a Mason of this Rite. This is his instrument. They're putting a Quran, which subjugates women, onto their Masonic stuff. As I told you, the Masonic Order was taken over. The American Rite Masonic Order that started this country was infiltrated and taken over by the Eastern Star Rite, which is from Europe and the Pope, and it's Satanism. You can tell right here. Any, anybody who's a Mason who tells you they don't abide by Satanism is lying if they, unless they just don't know. So this is proof that the Masons of the modern era are Satanic in who they're, who's controlling them and the issuance of these certificates. So that's a pretty big deal, folks. And I, I assure you, this instrument will be used in a court of law someday to show that this is not, these Masons are not supposed to be in charge of our law. Those are the, the Esquire and Doctor Masonic orders under the monarchical crown that are Satan worshipers, not the American Rite Masons that founded the country. And so when I talk about masonry and I talk about it being cooed, that's what I'm talking about. This is clearly not. There's no way an ancient and accepted Scottish rite, an order that's supposed to be protecting the ancient accepted Scottish rite of tanistry where women are femme soul, should ever have Muslim subjugated Baal worshiping quotes and things on. Now, you notice they look like they're from Egypt too. So they have the Egypt stuff all over here. We talk about Egypt. Now, who really was Scotland was founded by Egyptian priestess. So this is so the Masons are basically the fake Masons are trying to steal the the Eastern Star Order trying to obfuscate the American right, just like the same Masons of the same order are covering up the constitutional law. So the Masons as they are today are definitely being run by a satanic order of controllers and the mother council's going to be hard pressed to show me how they can call themselves a mother council of the ancient accepted Scottish rite when they're issuing certificates with religious quotes on it that subjugate women it's an oxymoron so they're so the more the masons are just busted out as a modern era as a cooing instrument they are not in compliance with the law that was brought here to control the constitution okay so now i want to get to some things um, related to um, a particular treaty, okay? Because people said, okay, give us an update on July 4th. Well, what I'm going to tell you about July 4th is that my son, this is just laid. Um, the Federal Circuit Court of Appeals is in a lot of trouble <laughs> because I, I have provided to them how they're not in compliance with the full faith and credit. And also showed them how their um, execution of the federal statutes in the federal rules of civil procedure are not being complied with, which is a problem because they have to comply with the federal rules of equity as trustees in their execution under the federal codes. Um, that is disclosed by their federal rules proper. If you go to the United States Federal Court of Appeals and look up case number, if you have PACER, 185369 you can read all the history of the United States related to your coup and also how the federal rules of civil procedure are supposed to comply with equity so basically what I have done in law is showed them how where you are at always goes back to the full faith and credit always goes back to the full faith and credit 
which means that they have to have seals proper, signatures proper, judges seals, not only that, but when there's a seal in a judge's signature on something, which must always happen, you either have to clerk a clerk signature and seal or a judge signature and seal. If you don't, you're not in compliance with full faith and credit clauses under the statutes. Okay. You have to have those seals and those signatures for an instrument of law to be legal, just legal. We're not talking about lawful, just to be looked at as legal. Under the code, you have to have a judge's signature and seal or a clerk's signature seal. Someone of authority and a seal. An official seal stamp and a signature must be on it. Those are defined in Title 28, 1738 and 1738A for child custody cases. Okay, I'm going to go over how they're also in other parts of law. So all the things that they do must be in compliance with the full faith and credit clause. Well, if you're affecting a false claim, violating federal statute, violating a treaty or any of those things in the execution of what you're doing as an agent of the federal or state government, you're not in compliance with full faith and credit. If you steal a child outside of those, not only is it a violation of full faith and credit, but it becomes a treasury crime of kidnapping and perpetuation of kidnapping under treasury law. So what I've done is pulled everything that they have back to the de jure instrument of our full faith, not more faith, not Muslim faith, Gentile Christian faith that says kiss our ass Pope faith, not just not cat, not Catholic faith, Christian, Orthodox Christian. We don't like the Pope Eastern West schism faith and credit folks. Okay, which means you don't touch babies faith. You don't, you know, there's, these are faith based laws. You know, big, one big thing in Christianity above all other, they were the only nation or the only Orthodox Christian Christians are the only people in the world who say that trafficking and messing with babies is a crime. So pursuant to our faith, if you mess with a baby, you don't get our credit. Okay, that's the law. That's, that's not a tournable in law. You can try to twist it however you want so that you and with your baby trafficking masters um, through the Babylonian slave trade systems and the Talmudic Jews and all the other bad people of the bad Muslim faith that want to do baby trafficking and hide it as admiralty law, which is what I'm getting ready to show you all. Uh, you guys are criminals. I don't care. Your faith has nothing to do with it. You are a crime criminal by our by our treasury because our treasury is backed by our faith. Okay, so when you find that there's a coup to try to overlay uh, Sharia law over our constitution, you can see why they need to because they want to access the treasury without following our faith. Get it? So they're kind of screwed on that. And I put them to the thing. So this is a really important thing in that. I'm going to go to a desktop of uh, the, the display view real quick because I want to go over some things. Okay. So we're going to start um, over here first. Uh, okay, where we got here? Okay. Okay, we're going to talk about this. This is real current, and we're going to talk about what is a United States citizen. Okay, this is very, this is from June 27, 2019. So what this is, is this is party to the whole citizenship case. Uh, that's now before the Supreme Court where they want to ask the question if you're, if you're a United States citizen on the census and they threw it out because they said you're just too vague in your terms of what a United States citizen is. So the Supreme Court is even affirming when I'm about to show you why. They don't want to say well you know the United States citizen is a variety of things because if you, if you under if, as soon as you all if you all were to read the pleading that I just recently put up if they put it up I will be putting it up on the internet in a Dropbox and I'll attach it to this uh, video when I do get it up. But if you read my last pleading, you'll understand the United States citizen is a very broad term that includes pretty much any negotiable instrument in the United States. So you can't go having a census question asking, are you a United States citizen when you don't even know what a United States citizen is? And they're not going to define it in the statutes, which is the problem with the Trump administration. Now, I don't know if they brought this up just to bring to the point that the United States citizen isn't easily defined. But by the pleading, I defined it uh, very specifically. So we're going to go to um, first in order to define the United States citizen in the manner that you everyone is being um, defined as you have to go to the Suits and Admiralty Act. You see down here, this right here, uh, this 46 U.S.C. 3. 
You see that right there? So this is uh, the reference to uh, suits in Admiralty. If you were going to do anything in bringing a suit in Admiralty, which is what all federal claims are, um, this is where the regulations lay, 46 U.S.C. 309, okay? And let's go here. So this is 46 U.S. Code, and um, this is just the general code, and as you see, this is citizen of the United States. This is one of the first definitions you'll find. It says, in this, in this title, the term citizen of the United States, when used in reference to a natural person, means an individual who is a national of the United States, as defined in 10A22 of the Immigration Nationality Act. Well, let's just go here. They do these. This is the definition. Okay. So this is just the redefining of that. Let's look up United States citizen. Okay. In this title, United States citizen, the term, when used in a geographical sense, means the states of the United States, the District of Columbia, Guam, Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, and any other territorial possession. So when they say United States in, the, in this sense, they mean basically the territorial sea of the United States. That's the District of Columbia, all the territories, everything. So in this general, ter in this title, the general term United States is everything, okay? So we're going to go here. Um, you, there's another reference we'll talk about here in a minute, which is, this is codified, 40, Title 46 U.S. Uh, code 46 is codified in a current statute that they just enacted in 2006. We're going to go back and talk about this. This is the reference here of 120 stat 1486. That's what I'm going to talk to you here in a minute. But this is the act that was passed by the 119th, 109th Congress in 2006. This is the most recent codification of Suits and Admiralty Act uh, of Title 46. So this so. 20, 120 stat 1486 is the codification of 46 U.S. Title 46, and we'll go over that in a minute. So we're going to now go to this section right here, 8 U.S.C. 101A22, and look at some terms in there. So here we have, and you know, I, I love uh, law, uh, Cornell Law. They, they have a great source for most things. They don't have the annotations, but they have the generals, and they're also cross-referenced. They will actually provide you with cross-referencing things. So here again, is uh, we go to 22, it says, so here it states, a United States citizen is defined as what is in one, 8, 8 U.S.C. 1101A22. Okay, so a citizen of the United States is a national of the United States. Okay, a national of the United States, according to this definition, is, is a citizen of the United States or a person who, though not a citizen of the United States, owes permanent allegiance to the United States. So again, this reference as to what is the United States. Well, here it is. Citizen of the United States. We're going to tag this one. A citizen of the United States in this title, except otherwise specified when used in geography, means the continental United States, Alaska, Puerto Rico, islands, and the Commonwealth. Okay, so they've narrowed the term United States to be from states of the United States, District of Columbia, Virginia, in territorial processions to uh, the continental United States, Alaska, Guam. So they, they're constantly twisting the term United States between the titles, and that's very important to watch. Now, there's also, let's make sure that they're giving, because there's one here. Okay, so then let's go ahead and go here and look at uh, naturalization and state. We're going to look that up. The term naturalization means conferring the nationality of a state upon a person after birth by means of whatsoever. So naturalization means conferring the nationality of a state upon a person after birth. This is done with the birth certificate. The certificate of live birth effects or confers a nationality of the state upon the person. It's That is the naturalization document. Okay. What's a state here? A state includes the District of Columbia, the Virginia Islands of the United States, and the Commonwealth of the Mariana Islands. You notice it does not include the states of the United States. So your birth certificate, by the very definitions in Title VIII, which the title of Title VIII is Aliens and Nationality, you are being made a state of the District of Columbia by your birth certificate. It says it right here in the title, folks. 
So someone who is naturalized is someone who's conferred nationality of a state in the in 23. The state that you're being made a a member of, okay, the state that you're being conferred a nationality of is the District of Columbia, not the state Ohio or the state Missouri. So the birth certificate is an instrument of naturalization that confers you to be a national of the United States. Get it right here, back up to 22, which means that you are a national that owes allegiance to the United States. Okay? And the United States, again, is not the states. Okay, it means the... It, Geographic means a continental United States, but specifically, hold on, we're going to go in here. We're going to go back here. So permanent allegiance. Let's see what permanent is. A permanent means a relationship of continuing and lasting nature is disguised by temporarily. So you are considered a permanent resident. Let's go up to here and see what this state definition is. Again, District of Columbia. So they want to tell you, they want to confound what the United States is in this term. So when they say continental United States. That means the continental District of Columbia. You have to understand the way they're twisting the terms United and State in here. But this clearly proves that the birth certificate is a naturalization instrument which is conferring upon you that you have an uh, a allegiance to the District of Columbia, not the state itself. So the birth certificate creates a federal birth a conf uh, nationality, though you really by de jure are a national of the state, the territorial land. So they've redefined you under these titles to be a, a citizen of the District of Columbia, folks. Okay, so that's where that goes. So let's go back to the Title 46, which was, and I, we're going to do some things here, but this is where I'm good at finding the law. Uh, this is all about the old shipping, and these are codified again in 120, but let's go to the miscellaneous section here. Uh, we're going to go to wreckage and salvage. We're going to go to salving operations by foreign vessels. Okay, and this is where the first mention of this fake treaty is. Okay, so this is salvaging operations by foreign vessels. That means by by nation by vessels that have an allegiance to another territory, not defined as the United States. Okay, operations authorized by treaty. So we are in Title uh, 46, Section 80104, operations authorized by treaty. Article 2, and this, this section does not prohibit or restrict assistance of vessels for salvaging authorized by treaty, including Article 2 of the treaty between the United States. Again, in this case, it is a, it's the whole totality, it looks like, uh, from and uh, Great Britain concerning reciprocal rights from United States and Canada in the conveyance of prisoners, wrecking, and salvage. Okay, this says signed in Washington, May 18th, 1904. And there's the stat here, 35 stat 2036. Now, if I go, if I click on stat 2036, okay, I'll get a little Rio thing. Let's close that one where you can, supposed to have a cross-reference open sources, right? This is supposed to be in the federal digital system. This is supposed to be governmental information concerning 35 stat 2036, which is really important because it is the, uh, it is the exemption that allows Britain to come into our territorial waters and convey prisoners, wreckage, and salvage into their national government. So this right here, so we're going to, you know, try to find this, right? It's supposed to have a cross-reference. Let's go here. Oh, doesn't exist. Can't get this cross-reference right here. It's not available, folks. So this 35 stat 2036 isn't, though it's got a quick link here, it's got a disconnect in the .gov website. Well, there's a reason for that, okay? And that's, I found it, but... I found this. This is this is actually 30 stat. Uh, what we're looking for. This is this is the uh, 30 stat 2036 right here, and we're going to go over it. Okay. 
This is see, page 2035. So this is how, this is May 18th, 1908 treaty with Great Britain. Okay. The point being is though you can't find this as a cross reference. There's a lot of things you can't find. I want to bring this up. This is Title 19, which has to do with customs and duties, Department of Homeland Security, vessels and domestic trade. They also cite 30 Stat 2036 as uh, a as the proper federal code citation pertaining to the treaty which allows Britain and its agents, esquires, and doctors to seize prisoners and wreckage and salvage. Again, May 18th. So the point is, is that every tree, every thing in the titles related to the conveyance of foreign of our vessels, vessels to be salvaged by other foreign. So this see the title here, we're under section salvage vessels. Everything related in the Maritime Code related with foreign countries being able to come into our territorial waters and salvage vessels is in this, uh, cited as 35 Stat 2036. So here is the treaty, okay? Uh, and this is a very interesting treaty <laughs> in, in its language. Um, but it looks very much like the treaty uh, a declaration of uh, the dominion of, of how to handle salvage. And it says right here, treaty between the United States and Great Britain concerning reciprocal rights to the United States and Canada in the conveyance of prisoners and wreckage and salvage signed in Washington, May 18, 1908. Ratification advised by the Senate, May 20th, 1908. Ratified by the President, I'm reading up here, June 19th, 1908. Ratified by Great Britain, June 3rd. Ratification engaged June, in, in, exchanged at Washington, June 30th. Proclaim, uh, proclaimed July 10th, 1908. So this is the treaty that all things related to the ability of Britain and its agents as doctors and esquires with their titles and nobility to come into our territorial water and seize vessels of um, of within our waters and our territorial lands for their own nation so they this is a treaty that allows britain to come into our country and seize vessels under admiralty law okay now what they cited it here is article two it says wrecks and salvage and so it's telling you the, the, the areas in which uh, they can do it. it. And it says, here we go. The high contracting parties agree that vessels and wrecking appliances, either from the United States or from the Dominion of Canada, may salve, I mean, salvo courts. Remember I tell you these are all salvo courts. May salve any property wrecked and may render aid in the sense that to any vessels wrecked, disabled, or in distress in the waters or on the shores of the other country in that so with in the waters so that's every river of this nation so there's they're allowing britain to come in here and salvo wrecks vessels disabled or in distress in the waters or on the shore of the other country in that portion of the saint lawrence river through which the international boundary line and lake ontario lake all these things and on the shores in which the waters of the other country along the Atlantic and Pacific coast within a distance of 30 miles from the international boundaries on such coast within 30 miles folks it is further agreed that such reciprocal wrecking and salvage privileges shall include all necessary towing incidents thereof and that nothing in the customs coasting and other laws or regulations or other countries shall restrict any manner vessels from either country employed in salving in the waters of the other shall as possible as soon as possible as practical afterwards make full reports on the nearest custom so what this allows britain to do is use any uh, border port to move salvo claims through from our nation to their nation through water ports now if you study the united nations treaties you'll understand that uh, they have extended this since this treaty that a port of calling is a hospital the emergency room of a hospital is a water port, folks. So now Britain can steal anything that comes through a water port of a hospital, thus your babies uh, being seized when you go into hospitals and you don't do what they tell you. Okay, so it says right here, I just go to wiki real quick because I don't feel like doing the, but treaties must be ratified by two thirds of the Senate. Okay. So now I'm going to go back to the regular view because I want you all to see what we got here. What we have here are the exhibits in my son's case. This is the 
treaty I just spoke of, right? And we're going to go over why here in a second. But the significance of this treaty is that it was never ratified. It has never been ratified. These are the executive journal proceedings. Uh, this, uh, see, right here. Let's see, okay, right here. May 1908, get it? May. It covers the date. These are the Senate journals. Now, real quickly, according to the rules of order and quorum of the Senate, which is document five of my son's Senate document, okay? The rules of order of the Senate, rules one and two, I'm sorry, two and three. Nope. Sorry, four and five, my bad. Here's rule four, rule five. Five. Four, I'm going to read rule four. So these are the rules of the Senate that were in existence in 1908, pursuant to voting. You've got to put this stuff in front of them so they can't get off the table. The proceeding, uh, uh, rule f four, journal, that's the subtitle. The proceedings of the Senate shall be briefly and accurately stated on the journal. Messages of the President full titles and bills and joint resolutions and such parties as shall be affected by proposed amendments. Every vote and a brief statement of the contents of each petition, memorial, and paper presented shall be entered. So if there's not a vote in the Senate journal, there was no vote. And they have to put the votes, even for secret treaties, <laughs> which this one apparently was. Though the treaty is not secret, the vote apparently still is because there is no vote on the Senate journal. I'm going to show you that. Rule 5, and this is important. Quorum. Amend... Uh, uh, absent senators may be re may be sent for. No Senate shall absent himself from the service of the Senate without leave. Okay, so meaning you can't leave the Senate without them letting you out. So if there's if there's you're in if if they're in session, they're not supposed to be leaving the Senate without authority. So if at any time during the daily session of the Senate a question shall be raised by any senator as to the presence of a quorum, the presiding officer shall forthwith direct the secretary to call the roll and shall announce the result and these proceedings shall be without debate. Whenever upon such roll call it shall be ascertained that a quorum is not present, a majority of the senators present may direct the sergeant at arms to request and when necessary to compel the attendance of the absent senators, which order shall be determined without debate. And pending its execution and until a quorum shall be present, no, but no debate nor motion except to adjourn shall be in order. So that's important because it's telling you if something came up for motion and someone said well we don't have a quorum and they can't get enough senators to attend a quorum the only action that that body can do at that time is adjourn because they have no quorum they've affirmed they have no quorum back to executive proceedings i'm going to read this again this executive proceedings because the rules of the senate uh will show you that we have none but these are executive proceedings these are notes these are the executive proceeding notes of the united states that cover the same period of time see that right there okay, these all these journals you have to go to the library to get you're not going to get them off the internet they are not on heinz you actually have to go to a library and pull these books because they do not want you to know them okay this is pertaining to a statement and i'm going to read this about this treaty okay Senate Resolution Number 477, reported by Mr. Schiff, Schiffstead, okay. in the Senate and the United of the United States, February 7th, 1931, that the entire Executive Journal, from the end of the 56th Congress second session to the date which should proceedings have already been printed and published by order of the Senate, to the end of the 71st Congress third session be printed under direction of the Secretary of the Senate with a su suitable index to each volume and to 500 copies be printed. Resolved that the injunction of secrecy uh, be not removed, therefore, uh, sorry, the injunction of secrecy be not removed therefrom until said printing has been completed or until so order the Senate printed, however, that the council in any proceeding under the Senate House Resolution 415 or any persons deputized in them. So what this is telling you is they had secret proceedings that they did not print and that those secret proceedings occurred between the 71st Congress, oh, sorry, 
especially the, the 57th to the 71st Congress had secret proceedings that they did not print until 1931. So that's important. This is within the executive journal concerning, uh, it starts on the bottom and, and so, but it says where White House May 8th, 19th, see that? White House. I'm going to read that section. Here's where it is printed for those. I'm sorry. I'm trying to make it so if you want to read it. Okay. Theodore Roosevelt was president. Exec this is the executive. To the Senate, I transmit with a view to receiving the advice and consent of the Senate to its ratification a treaty between the United States and Great Britain signed on Washington on May 18, 1908, providing for wrecking and salvage and for the conveyance of prisoners between the United States and Dominion of Canada. And prisoners, remember that. Because we're all prisoners of Britain. <clears throat> now, this is on the notes on what happened on uh, May, I can't hardly see, May 19th in the White House. This is a whole letter regarding a whole bunch of things that were done not lawfully in the Senate during this time period, which involve other treaties, by the way. I just want to particularly talk about this one. Resolved. Two-thirds of the senators present concurred therein. So this statement by the by Theodore Roosevelt, this is a three, four, four page letter that is dated on the end, Thursday the 22nd. See, Theodore Roosevelt, this is a part four, page four, Thursday, May 21st. So this is his report um, about what happens and he signed it on this day. It says right here that on this day, two thirds of the Senate present, no, you have to have two-thirds of a lawful quorum, not just two-thirds. You can't have three senators and go, well, two of the three voted for it. That's not a lawful treaty signing. But the way they state it is even up, kind of obfuscated. Two-thirds of the senators uh, present concurring therein. You can see, like it literally says, two-thirds of the senators present, of the senators present. Okay, not two-thirds, of just two-thirds of the quorum. That the Senate advise and consent to the appointment of a treaty between the United States and Great Britain signed at Washington on May 18, 1908, providing for wrecking and salvage and for the conveyance of prisoners between the United States and the Dominion of Canada. Ordered that the Secretary lay this said resolution before the President of the United States. So the President was given this treaty to sign or to look at on May 18th, and he was waiting for the Senate to give their opinion on it before he did anything. Next executive order annotation on this. In the same book, see, Executive LL, 60th Congress, first session, okay. A treaty between the United States and Great Britain signed on Washington on May 18, 1908, providing for wreckage and salvage and for the conveyance of prisoners between the United States and Dominion of Canada. May 19, 1908, received and referred, that means from the Senate. So on May 19, 1908, the Senate purportedly voted on this treaty and referred it to the President for passage by a vote of two-thirds of the, of, the, of the senators present, okay? That then on May 20th, reportedly favorable, sat ratified without amendment or reservation and made public. So this is the executive journal. Say on May 19th, the Senate voted on this treaty and affirmed it, okay? Well, let's go look. This is Exhibit 3 of my son's case, Journal of the State of the Senate of the United States, again, December 1907, goes and covers May uh, 8th. Here is um, a copy of page 479 and four se for, uh, 469, 470, where they talk about this, okay? right here injunction of secrecy removed you notice they don't talk about it being a treaty they're voting for they're talking about a motion to remove secrecy which refers back to the printing in the 1936 so they're talking about secret stuff okay all the secret stuff what's the first one during the consideration of executive business the injunction of secrecy was removed from the following a treaty between the United States and Great Britain signed on Washington on May 18, 1908, 
providing for wrecking and salvage and for okay so there's where they motion to remove the secrecy of it let me see if i can get it sorry i want to get this so you guys can see there it is a treaty between the united states right there now look down here it says at the bottom on motion, Mr. Lodges, at 4 o'clock and 5.30 minutes p.m., the Senate adjourned. No vote, folks. So what does that tell you pursuant to the rules of order? They had no quorum. They had no quorum. If there's an adjournment after motions, especially on the voting of treaties, with no vote on the journal, so there's no vote on the journal, they adjourned. So there was no vote taken in May pertaining to the treaty between the United States and Great Britain. In fact, they, they motioned for it to happen and then they adjourned. This is affirmed in the congressional record proceedings and debates for the same Congress. Okay, this is their debates. Oh, nice little books. This is also an exhibit. Yep, yep. Again, May 20th, okay, 2008. You have to show both pages because the dates go across the tops of these. See how this works? This is, the date is, see the middle of the index shows you the date. Okay, so you have to take both pictures of it. The bottom page says this. Wreck and salvage conveyance. The injunction of secrecy was removed on May 20th from a treaty between the United States and Great Britain signed in Washington May 18th, providing the wreckage and salvage and for the conveyance of prisoners between the United States and Dominion and Canada. Again, they're talking about removing secrecy, but POTUS, Theodore Roosevelt, says it's a ratified treaty, and yet there's no vote anywhere in the Senate Journal of any treaties being ratified on the 18th, 19th, or the 20th of the 1908. So what they've done is they've defrauded the statutes, folks, and that the entire foundation of Admiralty seizure that has been ongoing since 1908 has been a fraud of some un... Well, the, the secret treaties now out there, you can go read that if you look real hard, but nowhere will you find a Senate vote. In fact, if you go on, on the internet and say, hey, is there a treaty from 1908 passed by the Senate? There are no treaties listed in that act, and yet, this treaty is cited in every modern code up until 2006, which is the most recent codification of the Admiralty Maritime rules concerning seizures of vessels and salvage, that this treaty is still cited as having been passed. So that is another thing that I have found besides that the passage of the Tona was actually ratified, which I've correct. Now in my son's pleading, I have corrected the fact that this treaty that they used to found, have used since 1908, at least, I'm going to tell you they've used it since 1912, that that secret treaty has more to do with the Sustake and allowing the esquires and the doctors with their titles and nobility to come into the land and seize United States citizens. And we're going to go over that in a second. So basically know that the treaty that we're getting ready to talk about here was never ratified. So there are entire statutes that have been allowing, and like I, if you notice, hold on, this is really important too, uh, in the section pertaining to the ratification or the motion of treaties in the Senate Journal, you will notice that there are other treaties. This one right here. So the, it's this, uh, this has to do with what's going on in the border of Mexico. If you, I, I work with militia. We found on the border of Mexico in the Texas town, they have what's called a anchor. They have an admiralty anchor sitting on the border of a municipality in a municipal zone, and it's an obelisk. And they're trying to say that's an obelisk water. Th these obelisks are placed all as markers, which are, they are admiralty. I'm going to tell you they're anchors, officially anchors. They have to they're they have to be so big and so wide and so deep. So underneath this obelisk, I assure you, is this anchor port. They have placed these anchors as obelisks all along our northern border with Canada and our southern border with Canada. And they pertain to all these treaties that they say, well, there's waterway rights. Those waterway rights are for Mexico to be able to come over and seize United States citizens. So the attorneys can can so the attorneys can seize United States citizens, which are 
nationals of the District of Columbia, they can move them across these waterway ports so they can traffic your children as instruments all over the world through these obelisk-based reservation ports. That's where these come from because if you look on this day, there's more than one treaty that was not signed. So all the treaties on this day need to be affirmed as being passed because I'm going to tell you probably none of them were. The other one pertains to a treaty between the United States and Japan. Another one pr that which was uh, signed on May 19th for the production of Korea inventions, designs, trademarks, copyrights. Funny how the United States and Trump are now messing with Korea. And it's a possibility that the treaty between the United States and Korea and the movement of patent instruments between the two has been criminal since 1908. Hmm, wonder why he's over there. Uh, another one is a treaty between the United States. Uh, these are both from the United States and Japan. So there's two from the United States and Japan. The other one is to pertain to the protection to China of inventions. So these are all patent trademarks. So, so one treaty is pertaining to salvoing United States citizens, and the other two are between Korea and China and patents. Hmm. I'm going to tell you probably none of these were passed lawfully by a vote. And yet the United States government has been operating and transacting in patents with Korea and China criminally since 1908. The same way they have been seizing and salvoing United States citizen property since 1908 uh, criminally with the Esquires and Talkers in their Bar Union coup through these fake treaties. Okay. We're going to go over now some particularities that I want to show you so that you all understand where you are in law and what... Um, are called predatory actions. So I'm going to go back to the display. Okay, predatory actions. A predatory action is an action to establish and enforce title to property independent of the right to possession. It is a legal proceeding in which the plaintiff seeks to establish and, in, and enforce title to property. Predatory action must be based on a claim of legal title to the property and not on a mere equitable interest in the property, such as when you file a les pens for a child. Okay. We're going to go to uh, this. Okay, this right here is uh, the 120 stat that we talked about, 1486. Its title, uh, general title is, <clears throat> um, they have, a, it's, and again, here they obfuscate it. The general title is, I believe, let's go back here, is the, it has an abbreviated title that's odd. Hold on just a moment like really odd. Yes, it's the short title is 30901, okay? But three but it's not 30901. 30901 is one section out of a title that has 8101, but they redefine it like it's just a section, okay, of this code instead of the whole code. So it's really the whole Title 46 code, which includes a definition of back to citizens of the United States, same as. So Title 46, same as the codification 104. One thing that you will notice is missing is, okay, here's a definition of a state. Again, this is states United States. So we're talking about territorial possessions. The United States is again, the term United States when used means the states of the United States District of Columbia. Now, here's the interesting thing here. Vessel is defined. I pull it up in a minute. You do not see, it says vessel, vessel of the United States. The term American vessel is in this title and never defined. Okay. So, so I'm going to go over some key parts to this particular title. And I'm going to go up here and change the page. You'll see right here. I'm going to change the page to 37. Okay. We're going to go over some sections here. This pertains to venue right here. 31104 venue. So you all know where the venue of these claims are. In general, a civil action under this chapter shall be brought to the District Court of the United States for the district in which the vessel or cargo was found. Vessels or cargo outside the territorial waters uh, would still go to the District of Columbia, or sorry, District Courts. So this venue jurisdiction in Admiralty claims is in concurrence with the Judicial Act of 1789, I believe Section 9, pertaining to where you take claims of uh, uh, conflicts of jurisdiction and or uh, when you have two people of different jurisdictions 
making claim to these others property you would take it to the district court this is where you're supposed to take your claims and respond to claims when they steal your child messing around in the states is will do nothing these are you're supposed to be able to go to civil actions to the district courts of the United States which we did okay so the the venue for these claims in Admiralty these seizures and salvos of vessels of the United States and or American vessels by foreign foreign nations foreign jurisdictions including your federal government versus your state government versus your international jurisdiction are in the venue of the United States District Courts not the state courts United States District Courts okay now we're going to go to page 82 in this title when you save it and we are looking at 50501 oops I'm a little ahead 50501 sorry I'm a little off on my page here <laughs> vessels operating in revolving funds uh, I find this interesting because they're talking about vessels operating in revolving funds in this section you'll also find uh, capital accounts um, we're going to uh, capital assets if you read this and you and you know about CAFER accounts you'll understand I'm trying to see what I have 87 on here 82 my bad that's why 82 deemed operations general ah entity this is why entities deemed citizen of the United States so remember when the Supreme Court says you're too vague on what a citizen of the United States listen here's why by Admiralty law a citizen of the United States is the following under the codification okay under 46 codified in, in 120 stat in general in this subtitle a corporate the United States is okay in this subtitle a corporation partnership or association is deemed to be a citizen of the United States if only if the controlling interest is owned by citizens of the United States okay and or however if the corporation partnership or association is operating a vessel on the coast trade at least 70 percent of the United States must be owned by citizens. so you can become a citizen of the United States if another citizen of the United States owns 75 percent of you and or has a controlling interest in you okay so remember that a, a corporation this goes with Citizens United this is the SCOTUS exposing the Admiralty Code to you in Citizens United if you are a corporation where a United States citizen who can also be a corporation such as a state of Ohio uh, is operating a vessel in in coastwise trade which is anywhere in our waters according to the treaty right if some other United States citizen owns 75 percent of you you're a United States citizen so if you are a man and the corporate state of Ohio has a lien on you you become a mere fiction a citizen of the United States as a corporation or association if they claim to own 70 percent of the value of your body are you starting to get that folks okay page 111 one, one, one. We're going to five five three oh separated accounts within a fund. Okay. Notice the types of accounts, capital accounts, capital gains, ordinary income. These are the accounts that are to be held under maritime claims. I'm gonna tell you that these capital accounts are probably the CAFER accounts and all the hidden cash accounts. So if you read through this title and you can suspend what you think you know and and understand that when they talk about vessels and stuff they're talking about people and when they talk about capital accounts and offsets and adjustments it's all in here folks the whole banking structure of the Treasury with offsets and adjustments is in this see capital gains accounts look at these these are these are all ordinary these are all accounts that have to be created by franchises that are seizing <coughs> um, United States citizens you know page 122 Okay, here we go. Here's where they're here's where they're screwed, folks. Pledge United States government. This is under section five three seven oh five. Full faith and credit. The full faith and credit of the United States government. You notice they said the United States government, which in itself is a misnomer because the United States government, I promise you, is nowhere to find in this title. So this is how they get around the amorphous attorney of it. In any case, the full faith and credit of the United States government 
is pledged to the payment of the guarantees made under this chapter for both principal and interest, including interest, as may be provided for this guarantee, accruing between the date and default under a guaranteed obligation and date of payment, full and guarantee. Incontestability. A guarantee or commitment to guarantee made under this chapter is, inconclu is conclusive evidence of the eligibility of the obligation for the guarantee. The validity of the guarantee or commitment to guarantee made under the chapter is incontestable. That's the 14th Amendment right there, folks. All causes, claims will be paid without controversy. That's, that is Section 53705B. It's incontestable. You must pay these claims without controversy. Again, remember, all claims made against United States citizens will be played without controversy or they are incontestable. So uh, now we're going to go to section 143. And we are looking at American vessel. Again, as I told you over here. Uh, I told you there is a definition of, of an American vessel. Hold on this. Let me find it in this section. <laughs> Foreign vessels. Where is the American? There it is right here. 53903A1. An American vessel, including a vessel under construction. A foreign vessel. A foreign vessel owned by says so. American vessel is used in this term. The term American is defined nowhere in this statute because, uh, okay, I'm going to tell you folks, you want to know what an American vessel is? This. This right here is an American vessel. This is. That's why it's not defined anywhere. This is the only American vessel you'll ever find in the world. Your flesh as an American is an American vessel. Just make that clear. So they're talking about the seizure of American vessels here. Okay, the seizure of American vessels here. So, insurable interests. <laughs> the secret, and this is important because these are where your joiners are. The Secretary of Transportation may provide insurance and reassurance. So you want to know what the insurance for your American vessel is? Your Social Security number. So that's your 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 insurance on your vessel is your Social Security account. Okay. Let's go back up here to 147. We're going to talk about civil action losses uh, under 53911. Civil actions for losses. It tells you right here. Exclusive remedy. This is pertaining to, this is in compliance with Judicial Act 1789, Section 16, the De Jure Judicial Act of 1789, 16, which states that remedy at law must be provided or, or equity can be invoked. It says right here, exclusive remedy. So when you have a district court of the District of Columbia tell you that they don't have, who is the appellate court for all the district courts in the United States and you've brought to them a cause of action where they're supposed to be providing remedy at law for criminal seizures of children in the states, okay, in foreign actions of foreign agents seizing children in this title, it says right here, exclusive remedy, which means that is the remedy that all are supposed to do is a civil action against the United States under the section is exclusive of any other action by reason of the same subject matter against an officer, agent, or employee. So a civil action is supposed to be where you go uh, to, to do that. And it literally says exclusive remedy. So we're not supposed to have to go and claim admiralty. We're not supposed to have to cite this code to get remedy, we're supposed to just go to the civil actions and they're supposed to automatically apply these concurrence hiding stuff. It says in general up here too, if there is a disagreement about a loss insured under this chapter, a civil action in Admiralty may be brought against the United States in the District Court of the United States for the district in which the plaintiff or plaintiff's agent resides. Again, Admiralty claims. Well, you don't know anything about Admiralty, but it says civil actions in Admiralty. Okay, remember they have commingled all of the jurisdictions into civil actions. Still, when you go to these courts and it's a civil action, you're not supposed to have to cite with particularity the obfuscated jurisdiction of the Admiralty Code. They're telling you that we, their, their whole argument is saying, well, we're going to combine them all, so all you have to do is invoke the civil code and you can get to these jurisdictions. But they're not wow. doing that. They're not doing that. Okay? They're not doing that at all. They're saying that they don't have jurisdiction in invoking doctrines which make them immune. Well, right here it says... 
by reason of the same subject matter against an officer, employee, or agent of the government. Okay, that right there is telling you that these employees, officers, agents, and stuff of the government have no immunity because it says you can bring a civil action against them just as you can bring a civil action in exclusive remedy against the United States. So again, the, this is the law that binds them, folks. This is the law that binds them, 160 sections, uh, Secretary of Agriculture. As a real party of interest in this cause of action, you would name the Department of Treasury, I'm sorry, the Department of Transportation and the Department of Agriculture because whenever you want a seizure returned, the person, uh, the person who determines the value of the vessel is the Department of Agriculture because that's a agricultural lien versus a maritime lien. So I wanted to bring the fact that the Department of the Secretary of Agriculture and the Secretary of Transportation would be real parties of interest in all these claims because they are the ones that go get the vessel and or value the vessel and the Department of Transportation is the one responsible for going and seizing the vessel back from wherever it's been criminally conveyed to. Okay, so you're not going to your sheriff here. You're going to the Secretary of Transportation telling them to give your kids back, folks. So, uh, this Department of Transportation is the one that goes and gets the child. We're going to go to 172, and then I, this, there's only like two more sections on this. 172, uh, again, I think this has to do with the Secretary of Transportation. Here it is. Use and transfer of vessels. Secretary of Transportation may repair, recondition, reconstruct, operate, charter for operation of vessel acquired, transfer to other agencies. The Secretary may transfer possession. So, the, the Department of Transportation is the ones, they're, they're, they're transferring our children as vessels, as transferring utilities through the Department of Transportation, folks. We are transferring utilities through the Department of Transportation, and they are using these, these instruments of transferring utilities to transfer children who have been made things by somebody else claiming as a United States citizen to have more 75% rights to them. So that's what they're doing here. And there's maritime auxiliary claims in suits of admiralty. Your children are deemed, are be, having liens placed against their flesh with their birth certificate where the state says we hold 75%. That converts your child to a thing, a United States citizen, which is a lienable under the 14th Amendment and they have to pay all liens without controversy. Right here, 56307, return of vessels. When a vessel requisition for use but not ownership is returned to the owner, the Secretary of Transportation shall return the vessel in a condition. So it's the Secretary, you, you would send your writs of habeas corpus to the Secretary of Transportation telling them to go get your kid that they have improperly conveyed as a vessel in their criminal activities not based on a lawfully ratified treaty folks. So nothing that the Esquires and doctors have done as agents for Britain in our government since the falsification of this treaty have been legal. And that includes everything in the Fed Act. And then one last section here, because you could read this whole thing. Actually, I have two more sections, I guess. 183. Uh, this one is performance bonds. Uh, again, remember that there are performance bonds. It requires a charter... Re the Secretary of Transportation shall require a charter of a vessel of the Secretary to deposit with the Secretary an undertaking with approved sureties in such amount as the Secretary may require. So these are per faithful performance of the terms of the charter. Well, guess what? United States Corporation Company charters, as registered with the Department of Transportation as the transferring utilities for each state, are performance bonds charters. So these United States Corporation companies that are registered in each state as, tra as transferring utilities, again, through the Department of Transportation. If you read them, their charters for the United States Corporation companies in the states are performance bond securities. That's right here. That's So you go after their performance bond is the United States Corporation company as registered in each state. Okay. A couple more things. Um, and these are the important ones. Um, let's do, again, the venue, 204. 204. Jurisdiction of venue. Again, jurisdiction of the United States with respect to a vessel subject to this chapter is not an element of an offense. It, it, uh, jurisdictional issues arising under this chapter are preliminary questions of law to be determined solely by trial judge. Venue. <coughs> 
District Court of the United States. Again, uh, Section 7503. Let's see, it's 7503, I believe it's. Uh, possession of controlled substance. This is how they're getting everyone um, who is a parent getting arrested for a drug charge. This section allows the United States to seize without controversy any vessel that is in possession of a controlled substance or used to manufacture it. So when you are being uh, arrested uh, in your vehicle, not the carriage, and you are, you are dr driving in your vehicle instead of traveling in your carriage, if you have any controlled substances, uh, that, car, that, tr that vehicle is being used to manufacture or tr conveying by, tra by you know, driving across the high waves, conveyance of drugs, they are saying they can just seize everything in it, okay? Everything in that vessel and, and make a claim on you. So the car becomes a United States citizen at that point in time. The children in the car become United States citizens as auxiliary maritime liens, and you become a citizen because they're going to lay 75% interest on you. So they're going to lay a lien on your body and say they own over 75% of you. That makes you and be, makes you literally from, come from a lodial free law man to a thing, a United States citizen res that is subject to peonage and slavery by the 13th and 14th Amendment. Uh, again, notice this, the District of the Person or the District of Columbia. So when you're going to file claims in recovery of your children for criminal seizures and such things, which is the situation uh, with my son, where he was party to a drug stop, a drug trafficking, a drug, uh, a stop where drugs were deemed to be in the car. That's why they seized him as a vessel and stole him as an auxiliary maritime lien. And last section, so you know that they did codify this, 2007. Uh, salvaging operations by foreign vessels. Again, citing right here, Article 2 of the treaty between the United States and Great Britain. And then here's a treaty between the United States and Mexico. I'm going to tell you this one probably was not ratified either. I have not done the research on the Mexico one. But again, so Canada border, Mexico border, with all the obelisks along it that they're upset about that the militias have now gated off and locked the gate of, is because that is their port, municipal port, where they are trafficking the instruments of our children that they have stolen out of the country. So they need those ports to traffic them as things. So when you put a gate in front of one of those water port anchors, called Monument One in Texas, where they just put a wall. It's because they're trying to maintain the legal avenue to traffic our children back and forth the border, folks. That's the issue with the borders. And it's based upon these treaties, again, right here. So they're saying that the waiver of foreign states to operate in our what in the whole territory of the United States, these two things right here, these two treaties are giving Mexico, the Mexican border, territories, the ports around, and the Can Canadian borders, the ability to assist in the trafficking of salvaged and wrecked vessels or prisoners, okay, prisoners of Britain. So we're back to, now you have, um, now you have all of the law pertaining to these seizures. And what you realize is, go read this. It's got all of it in it. It's uh, case number 18-5369. It's with the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia. This is being delivered to everybody. This is being delivered to the Senate because now the Senate's in trouble because when I move this to bankruptcy, which I'm gonna, I'm gonna sue the whole kit and caboodle of the fraud as a pri as a private. It's gonna be, you know, I and I, I'm not invoking. I'm not. I don't have to. I can do it in a variety of ways. I won't be invoking, but I can prove that everything that they've done since the Fed Act. So here's what they did, folks. They did the 1812. They did the Sustake, they tried to hide the Sustake by hiding the Tona because you don't need a treaty where you create a Sustake if you don't have a Titus Nobility Amendment. I've proven that that was passed. Boom, they're done. 1841, the coup of the Eastern Star Masons come in instead of the American Rite Masons under the Pope and they steal 200 or 20 million silver dollars from our treasury which then brings about the and at that time they're in de facto as trustees so as trustees we can prove they stole over 20 million dollars from our general fund okay that's what the tona allows us to prove that the esquires at that point were trustees when they stole the money 
Okay, so that puts that puts that twenty million on the Pope, folks, as a surety. That theft brought about the first bankruptcy of the United States, which is fraudulent bankruptcy, which then evolves into the Reconstruction. Well, post Reconstruction Congress is illegitimate Congress. It has no grant in law except it just kept going because it needed to preserve the Union. But really, the Reconstruction is a criminal act by the attorneys, where they go in and create these codified codes that do not comply with the law. One being the Treaty of 1908, which was never passed, where they try to allow Britain to come in and seize people again okay so you have the the 18 the 1908 uh, fake treaty then you have the 1912 equity rules which are not in compliance with then you have the fed act the fed act is going in there in uh with a a uh joint stock trust company filing all the liens on all the united states citizens and pulling them to britain through these fake treaties uh, where they've made everybody a thing because they already say they already owe 75% of what we are. When your child is born, Britain already says it has it, that that child owes them 75% of the value of their capita. That makes them a United States citizen. So they thought that we'd never find it. I found it. Now you know where the coup is. Now that the Senate is being noticed and the military and POTUS are being noticed by this pleading, I don't care if the clerk puts it on or not. And that's another thing I want to show you as far as that. And then I'll get out of here because this is a long video. If you look here, we laid our, this is the final uh, order from the district. And I wanted to show you this just so you know how ridiculous they are. This is their order where they tell us that they're not going to, even though we refer to this court by the federal circuit at, in a merit review as a court with subject matter jurisdiction, they said they don't have subject matter jurisdiction in, in, at the beginning. And, and they, that, that's been their affirmation from the beginning. Um, and they're saying that we failed to establish a threshold from mandamus, even though it clearly states in the Admiralty Code that the district court should have adjudicated this as a civil cause of action and did not. In fact, they implored doctrines saying that they were immune, that all the actors were immune when the code says they aren't, even the Admiralty Code says they aren't. They talk about a, a writs of error quorum and be abolished. That is not the case uh, in the manner you could bring it back under proceeding in 2254 is a criminal cause of action, which we corrected them on that. But the, the thing is this, look here. They gave us, they gave us seven days not 30, which is it, hearing in banks are supposed to get, you're supposed to get 30 days to file them. They gave us seven days. This is how this, this is how the second highest quote court in the, in the country is behaving. Gives you seven days to do a filing and that's fine. Seven days before the clerk is to issue a mandate, a mandate. So this is, uh, we had, uh, you know, we have 10 days by law. After, we actually have more than that after a ruling to to reply. So we uh, the ruling was done on the 18th, uh, the final ruling here, um, where they denied the reconsideration. So we answered, and this is it was delivered on Friday the 28th, 2009, 10:38 a.m. Now federal mailbox rules says that it, when this was delivered on that date that it's it's served and the clerk is considered on the docket at that time even though it doesn't have a clerk stamp uh, mailbox rules for federal delivery especially foreign service the minute it's received by the court it's sir it's it's on the docket or supposed to be put on so 10 30 a.m we deliver this uh this this pleading which the significance of this pleading is that uh the way it's cited is and I will read it to you. See this in bank notice of pending default in a predatory action notice to all agents, notice to all principals, principals. Okay, so I've noticed them that I know that they're not in compliance with predatory actions and they're not doing what they're supposed to do based in the statutes. So we do this at 10:30. Look here. This is the mandate issued by the clerk 11:03. So they got this on Friday and said, "Oh heck, we're so screwed. She's totally exposed our coup. She's totally exposed that this is a fake treaty and now we're in we're going to be defaulted if we don't operate if we don't a answer and take cognizance of the case in 10 days." And then the clerk tries to issue a mandate. This mandate right here is a fraudulent mandate. Um, the mandate itself uh, does not have a seal or a signature, folks. Does not have a seal or a signature. So 
your government's getting ready to get shut down on its bank because we can now prove that the manner in which post-Federal Reserve, the bar union esquires and doctors who operate for the Pope have been using uh, the British conduit to seize and seize assets to the United States and re-tag them all as United States citizens. When you understand in reading this code what a United States citizen is, it's everything. It's a car. It's a building. I mean, so on a census you know, you can't say, are you a United States citizen and not define it as any any corporation and any person that someone else owes 75% in. And it's that's why they did what they did. Um, I'm showing you why the Supreme Court even exposed that the United States citizen is an amorphous term and it's clearly defined in some places and you didn't define how you want to use it in the census. And so <clears throat> now Trump knows why it's shut down. Now, in the past, when they've asked us what a United States citizen is, has, has it been has it been what they've been telling us? You're classifying yourself as a corporation or a thing. So Trump is now, they've removed that. They're, that's not going to be on the census. So they're not going to be asking you, are you a thing <laughs> that owes its allegiance to the District of Columbia? Or are you a person who has someone who says they own 75% of your flesh value and therefore you're now a thing? You are now a peon and a slave by that's been attached by maritime liens. So it's all right there. You just have to look for it. So I hopefully... Um, I will load up this document uh, in a Dropbox and we'll put it here and probably do another video on it uh, when I do do that. But just know stuff's just really falling real quick and your United States government and the coup within it and it's coup with tre with through treaties that are fake and never been ratified in the conveyance of vessels and American vessels as United States citizens outside and from our territorial waters along these water border uh, anchors that they have, you know, obelisks everywhere. That's what they're, they're in the shape of obelisks, all these border porters. So the militia, you see one of those obelisks on the border, that's a foreign instrument and it's a, it's a criminal admiralty anchor of a treaty that was never ratified and it needs ripped down. I mean, that's what I'm going to tell you. Uh, I have no problem going there. Uh, just give me a bulldozer. Let the municipality try to arrest me. I will own that state and that municipality because I know the law. Those are criminal monuments that it's a criminal treaty, it's a fraudulent treaty that was never signed, and everything they have done in admiralty seizures, in maritime seizures, and piracy and salvo, since the fraudulent aspect of that is for sure void. So they have a serious problem. So we, we can void everything back to 1908. That voids everything under the Fed Act, and it's on the record of the Senate, folks. So this is this is a turn in history that's not going to go back. They've been exposed about the passage of the TONA. Now they've been exposed that the treaty that they've been using to justify or to uh, legally allow Britain to seize prisoners and vessels of American vessels and babies and stuff through their titles and nobility, Esquire and Doctor, emergency room ports as defined in the United Nations water treaties as ports of calling uh, for water. Um, those are all criminal acts. Their whole thing has been exposed as a fraud now because that treaty is not lawful, nor could it be lawful to allow uh, Britain to come into any of our waters and seize. Uh, and the other thing about the Roman law versus American admiralty is if you look into the international treaty of water or international foundations, the distance of uh, the territorial water area of admiralty is a league from water not one mile inland versus the high water mark, natural water mark, all this stuff. They call it a league from water. A league from water, under the Roman term, is an, how far a man can walk in an hour. If you were to lay the league over every water tributary of this United States, the whole United States would be under international water seizure potentiality. So there's no way that the government has the right to cede those areas to um, to allow another nation to come into our land to just seize prisoners and things. That's a criminal act. Uh, that treaty, even if it were ratified, which it wasn't, would be a criminal act by a post-reconstruction corporate instrument that has no authority in law to lien or to give away a substantial rights of our sovereign and our sovereign waters to Mexico or Canada. So now you know where it's all at. You know all the law. You can go out there, you know what jurisdiction to lay in, you know who to CC, you know what they're doing. But they're going after your American vessel children under these maritime salvo courts 
And that's a criminal act by our Constitution where the admiralty jurisdiction is not allowed up on the land. Okay. Their international jurisdiction is just the whole world where they can just go steal babies and do what they want under the law of discovery. The doctrine of discovery. I guess it'd be their law. They would consider it law. But doctrine of discovery, parents, patriot, whatever you name. We're the God. You know, we are the people. And that that is exposed in the Dred Scott cases when they talk about municipal powers just being blank terms and we could just do it because no one's ever said otherwise. It's the law of power. So they're seizing your children in a law of power and trying to create these usurping twistings and justifications legally with these criminal acts of, of a post-reconstruction Congress that never occurred and uh, a POTUS criminally averring the passage of something now whether he was told it was or wasn't i mean the attorneys could have walked it to him and said it was passed by the senate and he went okay but um there needs to be an ins an investigation historically as to whether teddy roosevelt was a traitor willfully and the funny thing about it is i'm thinking that he was because if you actually look at some books written by uh, historians on 1812 theodore roosevelt the president was one of them so he he affirmed a treaty that allowed the Suscay of 1812 to be conveyed, or he affirmed, he said that a treaty had been passed, that conveyed to the post-Reconstruction Congress the Suscay Act of 1812 is what I'm going to tell you happened. And they did that through Admiralty Salvage Treaties. So they didn't even give us the same protections of 1812, which says that if Britain wars against us, any anybody of the Americas, that, that, that this is a null and void treaty. Well, now I can prove that Britain has been warring against the citizens of America through this fake treaty and the bar union coup and the doctors who have been our trustees since 1812 who've affected massive crimes against our treasury pre-Civil pre, uh, War and then brought about complete fraudulent fictions in the Fed Act where they created instruments of seizure for our children and just trafficking instruments back and forth to Britain and eating the substance of the people in that regard. So you have everything you need uh, now in that regard and I'll get the, the Dropbox to you all uh, as soon as I can. I have to scan it and I have some other things to do. So we're probably about 45 days from your government probably being shut down if they don't do something. Um, at least operating 100% criminally uh, because they can't continue to allow Britain and the, and the title of nobility agents to convey children uh, and, 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 and or instruments of the United States citizens to, to Britain uh, through these ports when the treaty is invalid. Like I said, even if it was ratified, you can't transact humans as things because you've redefined them by your admiralty code to be a thing or a corporation because that someone else claims to own 75% of the value of their body that you have bonded in a land patent. So repugnant criminal acts exposed the totality of the bar union coup exposed in a fraudulent treaty. And there you have